Pardon. Pardon. Ok. <coughs> So welcome back. This is uh, um, so we are. This is continuation of of uh, yesterday discussion about uh, the finding the explanation of uh, the mismatch between our the predictions we have so far and and the data in uh, in lab physics and uh, uh, well and the, the the place where we got was uh, to so finish and complete a discussion that explain us that uh, this this mismatch between the data and uh, the and the theory cannot be due to an experimental effect and the last attempt we did was to include this uh, uh, smearing of the uh, energy of each individual particle in the the, the bunch of particles that uh, that collide uh, which is coming from this uh, probability distribution function f due to this to the beam energy spread and i computed for you this formula then i also show you how to express it in terms of these other variables tau and y right uh, in which essentially the cross section that we observe is the convolution uh, so it's the convolution between um, uh, the uh, so uh, the, the, between the uh, um, the beam energy spread of the two beams and the cross section that corresponds to the collision that is truly happening. This formula is very trivial to derive. It's really just uh, classical statistics, if you want, that has to do with the statistical composition of this uh, of this beam of particle. So now uh, the true explanation of this uh, problem of LEP uh, is is completely different. It's theoretical. And it is uh, uh, the uh, effect of QED radiation. So ultimately, it's uh, the result of the uh, emission of one extra photon <coughs> in, uh, in our process. So we have studied E plus E minus 2 FF bar. And we just consider the diagrams with the Z, but of course we say we can introduce also Z photon interference. But something that could happen in terms of Feynman diagrams, you could draw a diagram, for example, like this, in which now a photon is uh, um, is emitted. So uh, the the there is a very last bit of experimental related information I must give you in order to explain why this is relevant. Okay, this is not the same process as before. There is also a photon now. So the cross-section that is measured there, uh, and, uh, and so the one that we should try to reproduce, theoretically, is uh, called uh, inclusive cross-section. We already know, use this notion, maybe, inclusive. When we discussed the, the um, problem of jets and radiation, oh, yes, sorry, in QCD, so the hadronic cross-section is an inclusive cross-section. It, it sums over all hadrons. But this is a different notion. Let's consider, for example, E plus E minus 2 mu plus mu minus. They are leptons, right? Just to make clear. What we mean by inclusive is that it's the cross section for FF bar. That is to say, is a uh, plus, we, we, we say like this, plus x. Uh, that is to say, experimentalists will check if there is a muon or, and an anti muon. Okay? And if there is one, they will count this event. They will, they will put it in that plot eventually. Uh, they will not check at all if there are photons in particular. So uh, this, in fact, should be the cross-section of FF bar plus the cross-section of FF bar plus a photon plus, if needed, right, if needed, uh, maybe also the cross-section with two photons. Okay. Uh, it's important to, 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 to emphasize that uh, um, whether or not, so that this photon, as we discussed, can be seen by the experiment, but not exactly always. In particular, if this photon comes very uh, collinear to the beam line, there is no detector can be installed for, for, for principled reason, as we explained. Uh, and there is also no possibility to detect the photon if it has a very, very low energy. Again, uh, for reasons of... Uh, for reasons of, uh, um, of, of principle. So uh, at least part of this photon emission cannot be resolved experimentally, okay? Uh, but uh, the, the, um, but so, 
but none of them was considered in, this, in, the, in that measurement. Then one could do also a measurement in which these uh, pho photons were, were, were instead uh, reconstructed to check the picture, but here we're focusing on this particular cross-section, so we don't have to worry. We can emit a photon and we don't need in any direction, and, and this will be counted anyhow inside the, uh, inside the, the uh, observable that we're willing to, 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 to reproduce. Okay? So, first thing uh, is to explain why this uh, should be, could be at all relevant, given that uh, if you have studied quantum field theory, you have learned that uh, when you insert new powers of couplings, uh, and if you emit more bodies in the final state, there is a suppression, okay? It's the same suppression that you have for loops, so this diagram here is in fact of the same order naively as the one in which instead you, you, you make a virtual loop. So it's a loop factor down with respect to the one without the photon. In fact, I'm referring here to the modulus square integrated over the phase space of the photon, which is normally okay, of order uh, E square over 16 pi square. E is the electric, the electromagnetic coupling, pi square, alpha over 4 pi, and this is a very small number uh, of order 10 to the minus uh, 3, okay? So why, why instead, uh, uh, so what's, what's the catch here? So the point is that uh, this estimate is uh, very often violated very, very badly. Uh, and so it's violated because of what is called uh, an infrared enhancement. Uh, which is like this. So uh, let's consider our electron emitting a photon. And so it becomes a virtual electron. This is an electron propagator. Uh, and if the photon has a momentum uh, K and the electron has a momentum of P, this has, of course, momentum Q equal to P minus K. So now, in the process we're interested in, then this electron will, uh, will, will, will hit the other electron, form the Z boson, and do this diagram that, that we had over there. But let's consider, just in the drawing, let's say a more general possibility in which there is another, uh, the other particle in the beam, for instance, the positron, that uh, then uh, hits this virtual electron and produces something. In our case, uh, this part of the process is simply uh, this diagram here. More in general, I will refer to it as the hard process. So now, the uh, propagator of the fermion, as you all know, brings a factor of 1 over q squared minus the mass of the electron uh, squared. And... Uh, uh, and so let's compute this denominator, the denominator of this propagator, Q square minus Me square. Uh, we will use the, uh, our usual light cone coordinates so that we're going to write that the incoming electron momentum uh, has a P plus component, uh, which is uh, E plus P3. It has a P minus component. Uh, so now I'm uh, willing to take the finite electron mass into account. So it is... Uh, mass of the electron squared divided by P plus. And, uh, and then, of course, it has zero transverse momentum because it's the particle uh, incoming from the beam. Uh, while for the photon momentum, I will use this parameterization. So I will call uh, its plus component of the momentum, K plus, to be one, mi one minus X times P plus. Okay, this is just a change of variable. I find convenient to work with this variable X right? So to measure the, the, the kappa plus momentum in terms of 1 minus x. Uh, then uh, it's going to have uh, some trans transverse momentum, pt, in general, okay? It's going to go uh, fly away from the beam. Uh, and then it has, it has a, it's going to have uh, k minus equal to pt modulus square divided by kappa plus, divided kappa plus, which is 1 minus x p plus. Right. Right. Okay, let's let's make it big. So let us compute uh, uh, Q square minus M square 
it's a simple algebra that uh, brings you the following result. There is minus pt modulus square divided by 1 minus x minus 1 minus x times the mass of the electron uh, squared. Okay. So what is the point? The point is that uh, from this formula, we are going to see in a second, that there are kinematical regions, so values of the pt and of x, of uh, the, the emitted photon, for which this q square minus m electron square uh, becomes extremely, uh, extremely small. Okay? It becomes extremely small, it goes in the denominator of here, and so it produces uh, an enhancement that uh, is not counted in this formula here. Okay? This formula is generic, it's like if no uh, big ratios of scales were present between here and there. While here we can have a big ratio of scale uh, if this virtuality, this is called virtuality, because as you see, it's the, it's the, it's the difference between the Q square of the virtual uh, electron and the uh, Q square it would have if it, if it would be a real particle rather than virtual. So that's called the virtuality. Uh, which brings uh, a low virtuality enhancement. or infrared enhancement and this happens in two well this happens anytime you 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 adjust p, you adjust pt and x to make this small but it's convenient to distinguish two region where there is this where there is this enhancement one is the one in which the photon is soft So, for example, let's take uh, Pt of the photon to be, uh, to be of order epsilon, where epsilon is small, times P plus. And uh, let's also take uh, uh, 1 minus x. Remember that 1 minus x is here in front of the K plus momentum of the photon. We want the photon to be soft. So let's take 1 over x to be of order epsilon as well. So you see that the low virtuality, the virtuality is in fact low, and it's of order epsilon. Okay, so this gives uh, order epsilon q squared minus m squared epsilon. But there is also another region, which is the uh, collinear region. which instead you take x to be of order 1, far from 1. So neither 0 nor, nor, nor 1, let's say 1 half, far from the streams, but distance, so distant of, at order 1 from the streams, though x is not difficult to check that for having a real photon needs to be belonging to 0 and 1. Okay? So the streams are 0 and 1, and when I say x of order 1, I mean somewhere in between this interval. Uh, and then instead I take pt to be small, let's say of order epsilon times p plus. So now the low virtuality uh, has this term, which is pt squared divided by 1 minus x, which is of order, um, which is of order uh, epsilon squared, right? It also has this term here, the one with the mass, uh, that I cannot eliminate. I cannot take so it no, doesn't matter how epsilon is, this term is always there and it's always, well, negative, but it's always different from zero. So unlike in the case of the soft photon, which I can bring to exactly zero energy because the photon is massless, uh, so I cannot, in this collinear region, make this uh, virtuality uh, exactly equal to zero. But still, I can lower it a lot. Suppose I am at LEP, the typical scale of P plus here is of order of, uh, I don't know, 100 GV, while the electron mass, as you know, it's half MF, so it's much smaller than that. Okay, so I cannot have an infinite enhancement, but I can have a lot of enhancement. Now, of these two regions, the soft one uh, is not going to be particularly interesting for us, because if I... Uh, 
because the configuration I have in mind is that there is a very little small photon with small energy that is, that is emitted. And so uh, the initial momentum P of the electron is more or less the same as the momentum of the electron that after the photon is emitted. That is to say, this virtual electron here will essentially have the same uh, momentum as the real electron that was emitted, that was, uh, that was coming from the beam. That is to say, this one here, then it's going to collide with the other positron, for instance, with the center of mass energy that is the one of lap. Okay, there is been no change uh, in the energy. Instead, if I uh, if I go in the collinear region, collinear, uh, then I am in this following situation. I do have uh, a p plus at lap. The energy, remember, is much above the mass of the electron. So P plus it's almost it's of the order of the energy, and it's much larger than the mass of the electron. Then I have uh, this photon that is emitted with a PT that we said is uh, much smaller than uh, P plus, or which is the same, much smaller than the energy of the incoming uh, electron. Uh, it has a kappa plus. So its momentum transfers to the beam is small, but its longitudinal momentum of the photon is large because that is 1 minus x times p plus, okay, which is of order of e. Okay. So this means that this photon uh, carries away, since x is far from 1, okay, and also far from 0, carries away a significant fraction of the energy that the initial uh, particle had. Then, simply this, this other one, okay, the, the momentum of this other one is dictated by momentum conservation. So it has a QT, it has a transverse, transverse momentum, which is minus PT, and of course it's much smaller than P plus and energy. Uh, and it has a Q plus, which is XP plus. And that's why I found interesting to define kappa plus in terms of 1 minus X, such that when I subtract it, I get that the plus momentum of this virtual um, um, electron here is uh, a significant fraction of the P plus of the initial electron. So what I'm saying in terms of energy is the same. So the energy associated of this, uh, to this Q uh, virtual particle momentum is essentially equal to X times EP. Again, equal because I am in the ultra relativistic limit such that E and P plus are a diff little different from each other. So EQ is e X AP, which is equal to uh, X, the center of mass energy, divided by 2. OK? So I started from an electron which has exactly the center of mass energy, which is exactly on the center. So there is no beam energy spread considered here. There is only electrons. All, they're all equal. All the electrons that come have the same energy. But then somehow this, these ones here have a variable energy, which is a fraction x uh, of the um, of the initial uh, of the initial uh, energy, right? And so this 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 phenomenon that is occurring then is sort of telling us that now when we perform the hard collision, it is like if this electron had lost some of its energy. Right? And so it's something that it starts looking very similar to this formula that I had over there for the beam energy spread. But still, here we are discussing about Feynman diagrams that uh, so we still have to work things out better to, to see how the explanation works. So the important, one important thing I want to uh, to make clear here. Uh, so what, what, yeah. So uh, in order to study this this diagram with photon emission, I want to do it uh, in a, a general way. First of all, having in mind a generic hard process, not necessarily the one of LEP, uh, because I want to emphasize an important property that one can show which is that uh, the Feynman amplitude uh, 
for low virtuality. In our case, it will be, co it will be collinear. Photon emission, emissions. So has a factorized and universal form. That means the following. Let's call M the, uh, the matrix element, the, the, the scattering amplitude of the full process. Full being the one in which you do consider all diagrams correctly uh, with the photon in the final state as well. So the amplitude for this. So this is equal approximately up to polynomial corrections in this low virtuality expansion parameter. It's equal to the product. That's why it's called factorized. The product between a splitting amplitude that we will briefly compute, uh, quickly compute uh, later and uh, uh, essentially takes into account of this uh, uh, splitting, okay, of this electron becoming a sort of electron uh, and a photon, times the uh, amplitude for the hard process, that is to say the amplitude for this part of the diagram down there. In this amplitude, very importantly, the electron that, that it's incoming is going to be on shell. So it's going to have, have exactly zero virtuality in this approximation. Okay. Times, times the propagator factor, the one over the virtuality, one over Q squared minus ME squared. That is the thing that, in, that eventually is responsible for the enhancement and also for the reason why I'm interested in considering this region. Because if I then compute the total cross section, this region that is enhanced is the one that is going to contribute most to, 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 to the final result. Ah, universal. Uh, very important. Universal means that this splitting amplitude okay, is, 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 is the same no matter which process I'm considering here. Okay. So I compute it once for all, or yeah, once and for all, and then I can use it for any scattering process. The electron will always behave in, as derived from, from, from this formula with this specific um, um, uh, splitting amplitude that now I will, uh, I will compute. OK, so few, few. So there is an exercise. Uh, that guided exercise, again, on, on the web page of GGI, that you can solve and uh, cross-check the various steps that I'm doing, that I'm going to outline for you uh, here to derive this formula and to compute the splitting amplitude. And the steps are as follows. So um, first, you need to define a truly on-shell version of the, Q of the Q momentum. So the Q momentum is K minus is P minus K. The Q momentum is equal to X P plus M electron square divided by uh, well, P plus minus P T square divided by kappa plus minus pt. And the q bar momentum that I like to define is, of course, something that should be as close as possible to this q momentum, but uh, exactly on shell. So it's going to be x p plus m e square plus pt modulus square x p plus. This minus component, I'm fixing it. I'm fixing it, knowing that the virtuality, so that the, the Q square must be exactly m e square, knowing the plus component, and knowing that the transverse component is minus p t. Okay, and so you see that thanks to this definition, Q and Q bar are similar. So Q is equal to Q bar minus the Q square minus m e square divided by x p plus. So the low virtuality, right, expansion parameter, times a minus vector, that is to say one 
So 0, 1, 0, which is also the n minus light cone direction. Right. Then, uh, if we take the uh, numerator of the propagator of the fermion, this is q slash plus me, and so we approximate it in the low virtuality. Um, limit as uh, uh, q bar slash plus me, and then uh, q bar slash plus me, if you recall the completeness relation for uh, uh, spinor wave functions, for the u or the v spinors, can be written as, in terms of the completeness relation, that is to say, sum over the elicities h of the wave function u h of some uh, electron with q bar, right, um, for momentum, u so u u bar h of q bar okay so then uh, we take our our diagram which has this propagator here we replace this this approximation and this uh, and this expansion and we get sum over h of the splitting part of the diagram that multiplies u bar h of q bar coming from here uh, times the UH, which was coming from the completeness relation, that multiplies the hard part of the diagram. Okay? So that's the Feynman rule multiplied type for the wave function, and so it is, um, it is scattering am the amplitude. Uh, this one also, right, we have uh, the wave function for the annihilation of a, um, of a, spin one half uh, electron, okay, with the LCD H, uh, which then uh, is attached to, to the Feynman diagram and becomes the amplitude. And so the result that we are finding, maybe it's better if I write it down there, is the full amplitude. It's not exactly like here, okay? Similar, but not exactly. So the full amplitude is the sum over the elicities of a splitting amplitude of elicity H times the hard amplitude, again, with the elicity H label, times 1 over Q square minus M electron square, which was the, the usual propagator enhancement. Okay. So mu S H just collects this part of the diagram. Right? with the elicity that, that it has, uh, while the hard amplitude, as you see now, is the on-shell amplitude that corresponds to an on-shell okay, electron with momentum q-bar, hitting uh, an electron, and then producing whatever final state it is. Q bar is on shell, okay? So Q is, is close to Q bar up to low virtuality corrections, okay? And so that's why I can approximate things like this. Right. Uh, in fact, in fact, there is one further approximation that I could do before I delete here. So you see that the Q bar momentum Right, is uh, um, it, it, it has a PT which is very small, right? Because we are in this, so we are in the region where X is of order one, and the low virtuality is reached because PT is small. Okay, so now when when it enters inside this hard process, which is a scattering at large angle and large energy, this PT is negligible. Okay, so in fact, uh, in the hard process, so in the hard process, and only in the hard process not in the splitting part. It is a good approximation to replace Q bar with Q bar collinear. That is to say, this thing in which I drop the PT, that is X P plus 
Me squared divided by P plus. Furthermore, the electron is, is very light, so this is something like, uh, this is really effectively equivalent to Xp plus. Zero, zero. That is to say, in the hard amplitude, so the hard scattering process, Mh little h, is the Feynman amplitude for an incoming electron that has a energy, the P plus, but also the energy, because we are in the massless limit, which is x times ECM over 2, and, well, some elicity, a elicity L, elicity equal to h, e minus e plus going to ff bar. Okay, so it's the same scattering amplitude that we have computed last time, okay, in this case only with x1, right, uh, that we have computed last time. Uh, so it's a scattering amplitude with an electron that, in fact, is moving a little bit uh, lower energy than, than the beam. Only lower energy can be, because x goes from 0 to 1, so this one has always necessarily a bit less energy than the initial electron, cannot have more. Okay. So also from this blackboard here, you could immediately read the, the, uh, the value, so how much it's the splitting amplitude, right? It's just this vertex, the QED vertex multiplied by the polarization vector. It's, it's a, a spin one half, uh, spin one amplitude, so it's very easy, so it's very similar, its calculation is very similar to the one we saw for uh, WDK and also then for the other calculations, so it's something like E, U bar H of Q bar, gamma mu, U of H, no, sorry, U normal, so this is the wave function of the initial electron. And then there is uh, uh, the epsilon, the, the conjugate of the epsilon polarization vector for the photon, because this is, uh, uh, this is a, a photon in the final state, not in the initial state, like in the previous uh, calculation. Hey, you're curious. And now, now we, get, we are there. So um, the... Uh, okay, just a technical note, I encourage you to do this calculation using these IF spinners, okay, because, uh, because it's really much more simple. So, for example, uh, the momentum, uh, the spinner C+, plus, just to give you an example, is uh, just Me over uh, square root of X, P plus, uh, zero, and, and the other one is also very simple. So, if you use this basis, you will find this calculation very, very simple. No need of doing any approximation, it's just exact, and, uh, and it gives you the splitting amplitude. Uh, and let's write them down, let's write them down. Uh, let's write them down here, because they're quite, they, no. Let's write them down here. So, mu s for elicity. Ah, one last thing. For simplicity, okay, but only for simplicity, because blackboard becomes too long, I'm going to take m of the electron equal to zero now. This is not necessarily a good approximation, okay? Because now I'm considering the soft process, not, not, not the hard. In the hard process, it's a good approximation. Here, it's not necessarily a good approximation, but at the end, it works, I mean, it works pretty well, well in this case. So just to make your calculation easier. So this calculation becomes easier in two, in two ways uh, in this case. One, uh, the formulas, no, the formulas are essentially invariant, but one uh, is that uh, now for elicity, so, okay, let's, let's consider uh, elicity plus one half for the initial ele electron. And let's now write down the amplitude that we can have uh, for the possible combination of elicities. So uh, H equal to plus means that the virtual electron has elicity plus, and so uh, let's take, for example, the photon plus. So E plus to gamma plus E plus. This gives square root of 2 E P bar T. That's the complex combination, remember. So it's, in fact, uh, modulus of PT times E to the minus I phi, the azimuth of the radiation, times 1 over root square X times 1 minus X. Okay? While if I take uh, mu s plus, so the same elicity here, 
and I say uh, I take, um, sorry, while if I take mu s minus, so the virtual particle has opposite helicity, e minus, gamma plus, e plus, right? I find something which is proportional to the mass of the electron, okay? And so it's going to be zero in our calculation, okay? I will come back to your question. Okay. Because, all right. uh, if I take uh, instead the mu s of, uh, uh, if I make, then now consider a plus that goes into a photon, but now velocity minus. So I consider a quantum mechanically distinct process from this one. Okay. This one is an electron plus and photon plus. And so this one has the true final states, external final states. And so they have to be, um, they cannot interfere from each other. E plus cannot interfere with E minus. So E plus gamma, um, gamma minus, it can interfere, can interfere because of the mismatch of the photon electricity, E um, minus. Everything depends on what I've written. So, sorry, mu plus E plus to gamma minus E plus, right? I get uh, square root of two E PT, which is now is the same, so it's modulus of PT times e to the plus i phi uh, times square root of x divided by uh, one minus x. And again, the amplitude for uh, the amplitude with h equal to uh, my, h equal minus, okay, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and so the one with here minus will be proportional to m, and so we don't have it uh, in our calculation. So in our calculation, since we are setting uh, the mass of the electron to zero, okay, we have only one non-vanishing amplitude for each h. That is to say, this one is different from zero, this one is zero, well, and the opposite way for the other elicities. And so we never see a non-trivial sum being done here, in fact. Okay. So for this specific way of, so for this specific approximation of doing the calculation, the result is the following. So we're going to get, uh, well, I'm not going to write any, any detail, but uh, it's going to be one over the flux factor. Then there's going to be some integral over the phase space of the final fermions, the integral over the angle, for instance, of the fermions. We, we, we could not do, we, we may decide not to do this. We may instead decide to have a calculation and we will do it for the differential cross section, a differential in the FF bar pair. We could study the distributions of FF bar. Let's not do it for, for simplicity. But what instead we do absolutely have to do, uh, since they are not observed, is the integral over the phase space of the uh, photon that is emitted uh, of the amplitude that now takes this simple factorized form, and there is not even the sum. And so it's just uh, 1 over q square minus me square. That was coming from the propagator square, because I'm doing the modulus square. Um, and then I have, uh, uh, and then I'm, yeah, and then that formula over there, modulus square. So the integral over the phase space of the photon, it's d3 kappa over 2 pi cube 2 e kappa. Or if you rewrite it in uh, uh, light cone coordinates, it becomes d kappa plus d3 transverse, sorry, d2 doubly differential uh, volume of the, the transverse momentum divided by uh, 2 pi cube times 2 uh, kappa plus. And since kappa plus is 1 minus x p plus, so this becomes dx. Uh, so d, d kappa plus divided by kappa plus just becomes dx um, divided by 2 pi cube, there's a factor of 2, there is 1 minus x, and there is d2pt, that maybe I can write it as pt modulus square dpt d phi. Right? So, 
The splitting amplitude clearly depends only on uh, depends on x, right, and on pt. Depends on everything, even on phi. The hard amplitude in the hard amplitude we say that we can make this collinear approximation. Okay. So in first approximation, the hard amplitude, the initial electron in the hard amplitude, does not feel that there is any pt, right? So this does not depend on pt. Of course, it does depend on x, because x is effectively the energy of the particle that is getting in. So it does not depend on pt, but it depends on x. But of course, since it does not depend on pt, we can at least perform the integral over the phase space of the photon of the pt of the photon. We cannot perform the one, uh, the x integral instead over, so the integral over x. And so we're going to get the, form, the, form, the following form, the following structure. So we're going to have the integral in dx that, again, we cannot do uh, because uh, the hard matrix element okay, depends on x. The hard matrix element here, modulus square multiplied by the flux factors and whatever, will reproduce the cross section for the hard process, that is E minus E plus, where the E minus, I remind you, as energy E equal to X ACM over two, going to FF bar. And then everything which that remains outside, coming from the, let's say, the modulus square of the splitting amplitude uh, integrated, integrated over PT of phi, does not depend on PT of phi because it has been integrated, just depends on X. And so I can call it Fe of x. Right? So in this formula, in this equation, I have exactly the same form that I had over there for one of the two beams, at least. So I have uh, an integration over the fraction of energy that the electron it's actually bringing no so technically it's really like if the electron was not always having the same energy but it had from time to time a fraction x of the energy that is variable exactly like in the case of the beam energy spread On the other hand, the, the, the physics, okay, a priori, was completely different. That is to say, here I'm just describing a statistical mixture of particles, of these 10 to the 11 particles that are in, in, in the bunch. I'm making a statistical description of those particles. Okay? But here, what I'm doing is just making a calculation that starts from a pure state. I just have one single electron with, by the way, fixed momentum, and it's a pure quantum mechanical state. There is not even this meaning, not even a wave function I've considered. So I have this pure state, and so I would, when I have a pure state, I compute the probability of something to happen as the uh, out E modulus square, that you can also write as E out, out, E, okay, this out-out, you can view it as the quantum mechanical operator that you measure, right? It's the, op it's the projector that is non-vanishing only when you get the right out state, right? So it's essentially the, the uh, so this is the, the quantum mechanical operator. If I have a pure state, the probability is the vacuum is expectation value, right, of this uh, operator. Right of this operator that this filter that selects the right final state. But now in the calculation, so by the effect of QED radiation, I end up with a formula that I would if instead interpret uh, by a density matrix. That is typically called rho because I'm finding that the uh, probability is a sort of a trace of rho times O, the same O up here, where the trace uh, corresponds to the integral in the X, in fact, and the density matrix seems to be just a 
diagonal density matrix that corresponds to a statistical, purely statistical mixture, right? And to be differential only in this x. So d rho over dx, that would be the PDF, PDF or parton distribution functions. Times, times, right? Uh, the same thing at here, but with an electron that has uh, that has fraction of energy h. So times out e of x modulus square. Okay. In fact, uh, the thing can become even more interesting than this. In the case where you do not have this cancellation or uh, this cancellation of the sum, to, in, the, in the case in which the sum over the elicities is non-trivial. In this case, we have only one elicity that contributes for, for, each, for each elicity of the thermal state in the massless limit. But for example, in the case of vector boson, effective vector bosons, uh, even, even photon, uh, what's there, Williams, there's plenty of other situations in which you can do a similar calculation. And you do have, in fact, mixed terms. That is to say, this sum remains non-trivial. When you take the modulus square, then, you don't have a sum over the elicities, and so you don't have a diagonal a density matrix row, but you need to, but you do introduce a density matrix which is something like d rho over dx, but with indices h, h prime, which can be computed exactly in, 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 in the same way. Okay? Actually, we, we, you, if you want to take the mass different from, mass is different from zero, you will find a non-trivial density matrix, which then is used in calculation in formulas like integral dx. Then there is the uh, sum over the elicities h h prime of d rho h h prime divided by dx. And then, of course, here, right, you are not going to have the simple cross-section like, like we have here, right? The simple uh, cross-section for, uh, for E plus E minus of a given elicity summed and averaged, but you're gonna have something like a, what is called a hard density matrix. So literally something like, uh, I mean, it's uh, flux factors, whatever, the same things that there are in the regular cross-section, but you do have Okay, you have the hard matrix element times the alter matrix element with a different elicity, not the same. So it's not the modulus square, but it's something with two indices that then can be contracted with this one. It's a generalization of the cross section, in fact. Interestingly, this type of situations give access to the quantum mechanical interference between the electron with elicity plus, the virtual electron with elicity plus, and a virtual electron with elicity minus. So these off-diagonal terms correspond to things that you can measure, right? That you could measure only if you could polarize your electrons, not as elicities plus or elicity minus. So yeah, there is a number of factors, right? In this definition, like the flux, there is the integral over the phase space, so pick up the, your, your, your definition in your mind of the cross-section, okay? And instead of mod taking the modulus square of one single elicity, you, you, you take mh times h, h, times h prime star, and you construct a two index tensor, which is the uh, hard density, uh, scattering density matrix. If I have time, I will show you a sim very similar thing for the decay of an unstable particle that comes from a very simple, uh, a very similar consideration. It is interesting. Uh, one thing that I should comment, maybe uh, even if it's too late, uh, if you really integrate over the radiation fully as we are doing here, there is a reason why this density matrix has always become diagonal. And that's elicity conservation that, for example, determines the azimuthal angle dependence of that. So the fact that this goes like e to the plus i phi, right? It's dictated by symmetries, and this will go like e to the zero. And so all these terms will have different, uh, uh, different dependencies on, uh, on phi. That will make that if I really make the calculation of the fully inclusive cross-section on gamma, this will not, uh, will not show up. But if I start doing things like, for example, I measure the azimuth of the radiation, then I can access that interference. But OK, so, so this is, let's not go to, 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 yeah, too far. Okay, so this is already interesting enough and uh, instructive enough. 
the fact that effectively we end up doing a statistical mixture type of calculation, uh, even if what we wanted to do, actually what we are doing also, is the scattering of a pure state. So let, let, let's see if I can briefly complete the calculation of this PDF, Fe of x. So, okay, so first of all, um, the, uh, the thing we have discussed so far can be used only to, compu to compute one part of this PDF, which is the real part. Let's say uh, very quickly, is because we have not considered diagrams of the loop type, okay? So I, I didn't want to write any loop. Of course, these diagrams are not particularly relevant for our problem because they don't change any energy, right? So the initial state, then the final state will have the same energy. So they're not the, the, key, the key ingredient, but if you want to do the full calculation, you also should include them. So this comes from uh, D2PT, so modulus of PT, D modulus of PT, D phi divided by two pi cube twice one minus X. Then there is one over Q square minus ME square squared. Then there is in fact a factor that comes from the flux factor. That is to say the fact that uh, the flux factor that you have to put in the full cross section uh, is associated with the fact that the initial particles have energy ECM over two. Uh, but when you want to reconstruct, to write this in terms of the sigma head cross section, no, you do have to take into account that there is, uh, uh, that the, this has a different um, flux factor. Uh, so this one over Q square minus M E square that we, we already computed before, it's very simple, is one minus X square divided by PT modulus to the fourth, PT. Uh, and then there is the splitting, splitting function squared, which are maybe still written uh, up there on the blackboard. And this two E square uh, PT uh, modulus square. So there is a contribution from, from the photon with elicity plus. There is a contribution from the photon of elicity minus that again you write, you can read on that blackboard. Okay, we are of course summing over the density of the final photons. And let me take just the last uh, step of this calculation to show you something important. So we have E square, well, sorry, we have, uh, uh, what is this? Okay. E square over four pi square pi. some function of x, which is one plus x squared divided by one minus x. And then here, the important thing, that you have to make an integral, which is, uh, which is, uh, um, which is the integral in, let's write it as the integral in dpt modulus square, so differential of everything, divided by pt modulus square. So if you do this, you will realize soon that you get a logarithmic integral. Okay, dx over x. It's not x, but dpt square over dpt square. Of course, this integral diverges if we don't specify uh, upper bounds for this integration. What's going to be the upper bound? Well, it's going to be something of the order of the maximal energy that the photon can possess. And that's going to be called q square. And in practice, we will set it to the, max to the, to the maximal energy the photon could have, which is of the order of the energy of lap, of order under gv. Okay, this, this we know how to set. The lower limit of integration is also important because this is a logarithmic integral. Uh, but, and to set this, we should, uh, mm, we should recall, uh, I, I told you that this virtuality Q square minus ME square cannot get really to zero because there is the finite, uh, the finite electron mass. Okay, so this means that uh, if you lower PT, 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 at some point you stop gaining in terms of singularity when PT is of order of the mass of the electron. And so clearly for a first estimate of this integral, we just have to take a lower limit here, which is PT modulus square, because if we go below, we are not gonna gain much, right? So the, the integral is effectively cut off at PT square. 
But again, if you do the full massive calculation, you will find the actual, uh, you, cannot, you don't need any, any constraint. You can do the full integral and you will find the result which is quite similar to the one that I get here. The result I get here, since it's a, log it's a logarithmic integral, is of course uh, a log. And so uh, this is the final, fully final result, alpha over 2 pi times logarithm of Q square divided by M E square, 1 plus x squared divided by 1 minus x. Okay. And this is the PDF. You see, it depends on also on another scale. So, it, sorry, it depends not only on x, but it depends only on q squared. In our uh, lab calculation, this is a fixed number. This is 100 GV squared. But in general, the PDF can be considered for arbitrary Q scale, which is called the factorization scale. Okay? This is the maximal energy up to which you integrate on the radiation. Or if you want, below which you cannot resolve the radiation. Or you decide not to resolve the radiation. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to discuss very well, or I'm going to discuss through a trick, the way through a trick, the way in which I so I can deal with these virtual contributions. Uh, the way I'm going to do it uh, is that uh, uh, so the true actual PDF x uh, q square is going to be the one we computed, right? Alpha over two pi. 1 plus x squared divided by minus x, log of q squared divided by n e squared, plus a contribution that comes from the loops. But I told you the loop do not change x. Okay, So you will find intuitive the idea that this contribution gives something which is proportional. It's a probability. I don't know why I'm calling it PV, but ah, so virtual, because it's the virtual contribution, times the delta function of 1 minus x. So x equal to 1 means that uh, the electron maintains the same energy. And this is the contribution that you get from, uh, from loops. Now, you would expect that for this, in being a, so for this one being a, uh, a probability density function, as I'm proposing you to interpret it, it should be normalized to 1, right? And in fact, it is. Now, and in fact, there is a powerful theorem known as the KLN theorem that ensures that that is associated with the cancellation of infrared enhancements, okay, that assures that the virtual corrections are precisely such that the integral, okay, of f of e of x in the whole around range of x from 0 to 1 is equal to 1. Okay. Now, one can have caveats in the sense that what exactly is the PDF here? It's a result of a series of approximation. You, you may de have different definitions of a what the PDF is. So what in general one has to say is that this is one plus loop corrections, but small loop correction. So it's almost one, okay? But in principle, you could define the PDF to be exactly normalized with one, which is what the physics is telling you. What the theorem is saying is that, uh, okay, fine, doesn't matter, okay? It's one. So at least at this order, for sure, I, what's, what I did is correct. Essentially, I fixed this PV in such a way that the integral is one. There is some subtlety related with regularization that uh, uh, if you look at the notebook, you, you, you can have fun. Uh, and this is uh, what I find. Because what I'm going to do now is just to take this PDF in place of the beam energy spread, right? And, and, and do the calculation, the same calculation as yesterday, and compute the uh, cross-section uh, for... Uh, for uh, for uh, for the lab Oops. processes that we want to study. So uh, this is called the initial state radiation because the diagrams where the photon is attached to the initial state uh, plays a bigger role, naively, but I will not explain you why it's naive. Uh, the formula that I'm going to use, well, I, derive, I consider only the emission from one from the electron, but if I consider the emission for the positron as well, of course, I get the same. And so I combine the two things. Um, here I'm writing, I'm denoting the PDF as this. 
So this is gonna call is gonna be called uh, the PDF for the electron parton. Okay, parton is this. This is the parton. Okay, of the particle electron. Okay. Here, of course, I have a positron, and so I have a PDF for the positron in the posi in the positron. Well, positron parton in positron particle. Uh, that however comes out to be equal because of charge conjugation in, in, in QED. And here I have the partonic cross section. Now it's, you understand why I was resisting not to call it partonic cross section the, the, yesterday when we were discussing the beam energy spread. This is the partonic cross section because the cross section for the uh, collision of the two e plus e minus, uh, let's say, after they emit the photo, so with momentum x1 and x2. And uh, uh, So, yeah, some word on the trick that I did in order to make this calculation uh, use imposing the normalization. And, and here you have the result. So now you see that things works much better. So now we have, compared with this plot, so now we have, in fact, an asymmetric effect. Okay, more goes down on the left and up on the right. And it's qualitatively, or at least almost, I think you'll say quantitatively, very much in agreement with this other plot. And also this one works pretty well. So this is the invariant mass distribution at fixed lab energy. Does not only have a peak, like you do have at the energy of the collider, but it also has the peak as the mass of the Z. And why? Well, because uh, out of these PDFs, what, uh, what essentially I'm doing is that I'm, I'm allowed to pick to pick E plus E minus that have a center of mass energy, which is 90 GV, and I told you that when E plus E minus have a center of mass energy of 90 GV, there is this huge resonant peak of the cross section. So the cross section is much larger if E plus E minus had were exactly on top of the Z peak than it would be if they had the, I don't know, 200 GV energy, which is the energy of the initial collision. This is called radiative return. That is to say, the particles try to go back in energy, okay, to emit radiation until when they go to an energy where they can produce the resonance. Okay, and so in the in the final state, you observe that the two muons, for instance, in the final state, they were coming from a Z that is nearly on shell, and then it has a mass. They have an invariant mass of ninety GV. Okay. Yes. We will uh, we will comment on this. We will comment on this. Is this clear? No, okay. So the dependence on the resolution scale goes uh, if the resolution scale goes in the alpha. You don't get any, so you don't get any one more dependence on the normalization scale uh, on, on the PDF. The PDF depends on the factorization scale. Factorization, not the normalization scale. So yeah, sure, but uh, okay. What I'm saying here is that of course this factor needs to cancel this factor, so it also depends on the scale, right? What I'm doing here is just uh, picking up this factor such as to be normalized. Now, if you're interested in, in the details, since there is a singularity, I cannot integrate this. I, I, we can discuss later. Okay? But yeah, the logic is that I'm fixing this just, just to make it integrated to one. <clears throat> More questions? Sorry, 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 sorry. No, the, as, as I say, the radiative correction to the process needs to be taken account separately from this. It's the loop, okay? It's, 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 a, it's literally this loop. Also, this loop you can study in a factorized universal manner, but of course it's a different study, and it brings a different result, which, which then fixes this, this coefficient. Okay, so let's try now to, to, to go faster. And especially what I want to do now is to try to 
generalize. I mean, we have seen a lot of calculations and uh, we addressed specific problems, okay? This is uh, a specific lab measurement. Oops. A specific lab measurement. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's even, so it's just a fraction of what that lab did, right? But, 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 uh, the, but the elements that I have introduced should allow me now to generalize and to discuss the whole of collider physics, at least uh, uh, telling you a few words about the LEC uh, in, uh, in a relatively short time and being relatively, hopefully, uh, clear. So uh, first, uh, let me try to generalize this notion uh, associated with this PDF of the electron into the, into the electron. And here we have to make a distinction between particles Okay. and uh, partons. So particles are uh, literally, particles are the single particle states that we studied on the first day. Okay. So they have well-defined uh, mathematical uh, meaning and, and, and well-defined mathematical notion. And uh, let's say the electron at lap or the positron is a particle, the uh, proton and at the LAC is a particle. Uh, the muon at the muon collider is, is a particle. What are partons? Partons are more mysterious objects. Okay? What we, when we speak about particle, partons, what we literally have in mind, I think I do have in mind at least, uh, is nearly on shared lines of Feynman diagrams that can be treated as they were, as if they were on shell particles in calculations. So that's why I wanted to emphasize that uh, when I compute this, uh, right, uh, this diagram, I have here a particle, uh, the electron that emits a particle, uh, and here there is a parton, however. No, I don't want to call this one with the same name as the other particles, because in fact, this was uh, off shell. This was a virtual quantum uh, that somehow was described in the Feynman diagram, but that, in some sense, is getting on shell in the course of the calculation. Uh, what exactly are physical particles? I'm not sure. So this is the mathematical particles. Particles, partons are not very well-defined object, but it's true that uh, whatever you want to understand about collider physics needs about speaking about the interplay between these two different uh, uh, things. We have seen, as explicitly as I could do this calculation, we have seen that particles contain partons And uh, this is due to initial state radiation. Right. In particular, we have uh, computed, and uh, let me write it once again, this probability for an, el a a an electron uh, particle, E, for an electron particle, E, to contain an electron, but with the fraction x of the initial momentum. That's what the scale q squared. And this was, once again, alpha 2 pi log q squared me squared 1 plus x squared divided 1 minus x. OK. We could have done another calculation that, uh, uh, that would correspond uh, to this type of processes in which I do have the electron, but then I emit a real electron. And then there is a photon that now is a parton, is off shell, that, uh, uh, that participates to the scattering process. For example, I could have this, this uh, photon scattering with the positron and doing photon, photon positron, well, a simple process like this. And again, I could have done all the kinematics similar to what I did before, and I will find that there is an enhanced region in the collinear direction in which this photon has an energy which is. Uh, a fraction x of the center of mass energy divided by two, or say, of the initial energy that this, uh, that this particle used to have. And so I could have uh, obtained 
uh, a different type of PDF. So the PDF of the photon, this time parton, content of the particle electron, which is uh, alpha over 2 pi times the logarithm of q square over me square times 1 plus 1 minus x square divided though by x, which goes like 1 over x. Oh, I want to say that this is contain uh, the okay, this is a general thing, right? Particles contains many different species of particles, and uh, the way in which this context is quote unquote distributed in this notion of PDF can be very different uh, in different for different type of partons. So inside the electron, we say that we can have the electron. We can say we can have the photon. And this is the supposed to be a plot of the PDF. So the one of the electron, we have also seen a plot before, is strongly picked at x equal to 1. For the vast majority of the times, in fact, the electron parton, right, has, 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 has the same energy as, as, the, uh, as the electron particle. And the fact that we found the peak here, the fact that it was this huge enhancement here, as high as this one, uh, it's just due to the fact that the cross-section is huge because you are on the resonant peak. But in terms of luminosity, in terms of how many there are, it's just a tail, okay? It's just a tail, logarithmic tail. And this, and this is the electron um, in the electron PDF. If I study the photon PDF instead, you see that there is a singularity. We should discuss, uh, well, we may need <laughs> to discuss how to cancel it, but it doesn't matter. So there is a singularity here that makes that the vast majority of the photons which are inside the electron, that's also called the Weizsäcker Williams approximation. Um, that uh, the vast majority of the photons which are in the electron, there are a lot of photons, okay, probability becomes peaked and very high, but they are, uh, but they are uh, at low x. So they bring a very small fraction of the uh, momentum. So for instance, at LEP, I don't know, you may want to study photon photon fusions processes producing, uh, who knows, pi zero. I don't know what, what, what you will do with this, but. Uh, uh, but, but there will be a lot of photon photon scattering taking place at LEP by this PDF, diagrammatically represented like this. But if you plot their invariant mass, it will be uh, in the very low region. So very, very low, much lower than, 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 than these ones numbers that we're putting here. So here will be a lot of gamma gamma collisions, while the, all the rest will be uh, E plus E minus condition, collisions with the structure that, that we have already seen in previous plots. Okay, some more comments also uh, about more emissions or more uh, corrections to this, to this formula that we derived. So because after all, what we did was a simple three-level calculation and all the rest was interpretation to, to, to get a feeling of the result of these partons, but do we really need this interpretation? Uh, to some extent, uh, well, I'm not sure of the answer, but there is one thing that you should take into account. We could do this three-level calculation, and this was uh, right, uh, in the context of LEP, because this parameter, and I think it's the fourth time I write it down, alpha over 2 pi log of q square over me square, where q in the case of LEP is under GV, this parameter, uh, so, it's still small. There is the logarithm, which, has this, which is this infrared enhancement I was telling you about with respect to the naive estimate alpha over 4 pi, right? So, it's larger than alpha over 4 pi, but still, alpha over 4 pi was so small that the logarithm has not yet made it to compensate. It's around 0 0.03. This, this, this parameter is called alpha log. So in general, if you have some infrared type of structure, some of, of theory in which there is a high scale and a low scale, the high scale being this Q square factorization scale, uh, you can estimate what's the importance of collinear emissions. So collinear, like, like, like PDF, PDF. 
uh, as this parameter alpha two pi well you can put the two or not as you like uh, log q square over m e square there is also another parameter that I should mention which is alpha log square okay so alpha log square which is alpha over 2 pi times the square of the logarithm of q square minus m e square this is also known as the Sudakov uh, um, parameter and uh, uh, and this is not associated with PDF. it's not relevant for pdf this parameter it's associated with soft and collinear uh, type of radiation that we will not discuss and collinear okay this is just to say that there is quite well understood theory that you can use to, to understand at least uh, where you can do these perturbative calculations like we did so if alpha log is small you can do just a three-level calculation um, if alpha log is large or for other problem if alpha log, log square is large meaning larger than one uh, then you are obliged to consider infinitely many diagrams to perform what is called a resumation Which is to say, uh, I mean, let's say in the case of lab, it would mean that uh, you have to include uh, all possible loops and all possible also, as we was asked before, all possible emissions of different uh, photons at any of them. Of course, you cannot include uh, truly the full diagram, but you include the very smartly include only the log enhanced part of these diagrams. And now, what I wanted to just to tell you without entering in any of these, which is exciting, extremely exciting and cool, but I just wanted to tell you that these resumations that not for all observables, but for many, there are relatively well-developed techniques to do that we know how to do. When we know how to do them, um, I think um, uh, as far as I know, at least, it's always because we do prove first or assume the factorized picture. That is to say, uh, if I really want to make this resumation, in the vast majority of the case, uh, I should take as a starting assumption the formula that I, uh, yeah, the partonic formula, the Spartan versus Spartan, if you want, correspondence, uh, the fact that the cross-section is the convolution of PDFs with our process uh, is the starting point. Okay? That is to say, Sometimes I can prove that, in fact, factorization uh, and uh, part of particle duality is okay. Uh, sometimes I cannot. But if I assume it, then it's where I can do this these resumations and then, of course, compare them with the data. Right? And, and, and they work. And as we've seen, they are essential to compare, uh, they are essential to compare with the data, even in this simple uh, perturbative case. Uh, in the case of PDF, the resumation of this alpha log is particularly well known. Is due, is due to Altarelli and Parisi. It is the Altarelli-Parisi evolution equation that that's how Italian call them. Others, they, they call it DigiLab because apparently there is a lot of Russian authors uh, on top of Altarelli and Parisi that, that did this uh, something, some somewhere, right? And so this DigiLab is a technique that allows, that would allow me to go from this uh, simple formula, sorry, from that simple formula from the PDF to a resumed PDF, which essentially uh, would include, on top of what I did, would include also would include also multiple emission of any possible number of photons. So what what, what you were asking um, before. By the way, at the, at the order in which you emit two photos, so at the second order in this alpha log, you also encounter the last uh, PDF of the electron particle, which is the PDF of the anti-electron. This emerges from this electron photon, which then becomes splitting into pair, becomes uh, uh, a, 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 a positron particle. Okay. This is of order alpha square, it's alpha log squared. In our case, in lab energies, it's extremely small, it's 0 0.03 square, right? So, so that's why we ignore it. But, uh, um, okay. 
By the way, there is no distinction uh, this level from QPD and QCD. And QCD, of course, alpha is much larger, and the log can also be much larger. And so all this is systematically something that you always have to the, to the sum, okay? If you, if you want to make a, a prediction, right? Uh, well, uh, good question. Uh, are some energies, so Q squared larger than? Yes, yes. At the same order, can also become immune. Yes, that's right. But, uh, okay, let me, yeah, okay, right. So uh, uh, it's a pity that I cannot tell you anything about DigiLab, but for example, the lab, uh, see the lab, the, the Peskin book, <coughs> it's, uh, uh, it, I think it's pretty clear on this. Also the lectures by Michelangelo Mangano, uh, I could point you out what they are about them, okay? So, right, so, um, well, some more comments. A priori, any species of particle contains all species of particles. So, for instance, if I start from a photon, okay, that can emit a real electron and, uh, I don't know, an electron or a positron, right? something like this. So, this, okay. What's going to be this? It's going to be the PDF of the electron or of the positron, depending on what you pick up, inside the photon particle. Okay. Now this is important. Uh, it's telling you that there is no reasonable way in which you can think to uh, PDF as describing the content of objects. Because it's completely obvious that a photon cannot contain an electron because the electron is massive and the photon is massless. Right? About the mass of, uh, let's say, particles and, and partons, uh, uh, the, 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 the criterion, so there is no connection between uh, the mass of the particles and particles. As I say, the electron can be uh, inside the photon. What you have to monitor instead is the factorization scale uh, Q. That is to say, uh, uh, so the, 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 in our calculation, everything was coming from uh, this enhancement of the propagator. And uh, if now I have here some parton of mass, sorry, sorry, some, some propagator with mass m, okay, then the virtuality becomes q square minus m square. And you can easily check by the previous calculation that this is bounded by 1 minus x m square. That is to say, I cannot never go, okay, to lower virtuality than the mass that goes into this propagator. Okay. So, for this to be an announcement relative to the, all the rest of the diagrams, uh, it would mean that this is getting small with respect to the hard scattering scale, right? In our case, it was the lap scale, right? We say the electron mass is small, so there is no problem. Uh, in this type of processes, the electron uh, can be, leads to an announcement because the virtuality is bounded, but is bounded by the mass of the electron that is small. But if the mass of the parton is, is much larger, right, than this scale, which is the factorization scale, then there is no way in which the part can be inside the particle. Uh, so let's say the criterion is whether or not Q square is much larger than uh, M square. And so the, the true statement is that at some point, at some order, all possible, um, at some, point, some order, the uh, PDF at uh, factorization scale larger than the mass of any parton will start containing that parton as well. Just to give you, just for example, at lap energies, this was not happening, but if I am at 10 TV muon collider energies, factorization scale of the order of TV, let's say, or more, then I start having also things like this. I do have a nearly on shell virtual W boson parton, which I can emit out of, for example, a muon, right? And so I do have at these energies in the PDF of the muon, I do have in the content of the so in the fake, fake content of the muon, I also have uh, a W boson inside the muon. But this, you do can speak about this only when Q square is much larger than the mass of the W boson square. For masses below, there is no notion and no way and no reason to talk, of course, about the PDF of the W inside the muon. Okay. 
So the, the higher factorization scale, the more you access more, say, uh, partonic, quote unquote, content uh, of objects, of things. The effective W, the effective Z boson, similarly, uh, that you have at high energies. So our next, next task will be to generalize all these notions in a discussion, brief discussion about uh, the Large Hadron Collider, about QCD then. So uh, let, let's, let's try to list So we discussed everything in the retro week context. Let's let's try to discuss briefly what what's the difference in in, in QCD. So the partons, okay, are the quarks and the, the gluons. There is no uh, proton parton because there is no Feynman diagram or no theoretical description of QCD of atom physics that contains a proton. So never, you will never speak about the proton particle. The particles, as you know very well, are instead the, the proton or the pi or the, the lambda. So let's say the stable baryons. Okay? And also this you know very well. There is no way to uh, think of a quark or a gluon particle because of color confinement. So a minor, very minor difference between uh, uh, QED and electroweak physics is that parton and partons do not share the same name. We could speak about the electron, parton, and the electron particle. We give them the same name because there is a sort of correspondence. Maybe here there is not this correspondence. The reason is deep uh, in the sense that uh, it's color confinement that makes that the degree of freedom that you use for a perturbative description at high energy that have nothing to do with the degree of freedom that corresponds somehow to the particles. The reason is deep, but the practical effects are limited. Okay. It's just a change of name. Of course, uh, there are differences. Uh, so let's try to list them. Uh, if you study uh, PDFs, of course, of QCD, they are not calculable. But this is not because of some alpha log, as we were discussing before. They're not calculable because alpha is large. So explicitly, what you cannot calculate what you cannot calculate is the PDF of works, of course, now inside protons and so on, uh, at a factorization scale, already at a factorization scale of order lambda infrared square. Okay. So uh, I remind you that so the alpha logs right are become large when q squared becomes large because the log becomes large right. So in for example in, in, in electroweak physics in, in QED if you are at factorization scale that are of the order of the infrared scale of the masses the calculation works like at lab it can be done perturbatively. Then you can use Atarelli Parisi to get evolution and so you get all the powers of this alpha l which is becoming large when q is becoming very large but you know how to how to model it with this resumation. In the case of QCD, the problem is not doing Altarelli Parisi. In fact, uh, you can very precisely verify the Altarelli Parisi evolution, uh, DigiLab, for, for, for the PDF and go to Q squared scale, which is very, very high. Right? That's not the problem. That's, that's OK. The problem, of course, is getting uh, this thing in the very first place because alpha itself is large, while alpha uh, is small. And so uh, in, in a true week, uh, and so that's the issue. It's not a fully conceptual issue in the sense that, in principle, lattice calculation can um, can compute the PDF from first principles. But concretely, what they are done is, uh, what, what, what we do for now is to uh, measure this PDF somewhere else and then obtain uh, the predictions. By the universality that we discussed before, we can measure the PDF in any process and then reuse them in any other process. And then you make what's called the PDF fit that gives you this type of plots here, uh, in which you have uh, now, in the case of a proton particle, its content of all possible things up, down, anti-down, gluon, strange, charm, okay, charm, even charm, um, at uh, a factorization scale, mu square, 
of order 10 GV squared, so it will be, I think it's 3 GV, so it's 3 squared, right? Um, um, GV, so very close to, uh, to lambda QCD, this one here. And this is the evolution of, of, of the thing at energies of the lap energy type, 10 to the, four, 10 to the 2 uh, GV to the second power. Uh, oh, notice one thing. So you see that the B bottom quark at this, in this plot is present and is not present in this plot. And of course, this is because it's, it's 5 GV. So it's above the factorization scale in this plot, which is done at around 3 GV. Okay, and so it's not a pattern, it becomes a pattern when you go to higher energy. And all this is utterly very easy, it's matching, I mean, these, these calculations. Uh, well, this is experimental input. Sure, this is measurement, then, uh, okay, right. Uh, what else? Yeah, another important thing. Uh, there are two types of PDFs, the valence, which are the ones that peak here, and the C PDF. So before I was talking to you about the photon PDF, the photon is definitely a C PDF because it's peaked at very small x, like, 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 like these other ones, they're called C, I don't know why. But the gluon, the strange, the anti up, the anti down, uh, they, they, they all peak at very small x. There are uh, these valence quark up and down in particular, okay, the constituents, quote unquote, in uh, some approach to the proton modeling that uh, is, are very different and they do instead peak at large x, but not at x equal to 1. There is no PDF here that has a huge peak at x equal to 1, like we saw instead for the PDF of the electron in the electron. And it's very important, because when we collide electrons, then we do have a lot of electron partons that bring the entire energy of, of the electron. Well, if we collide protons, in order to have some partons with x equal to 1, it's very, 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 very unlikely. Okay? And this is also why if you have to build a proton collider and you want to access a certain uh, scale okay, by your partonic collision, which are the ones that truly probe, if you want, short distance physics, uh, and then you have to build this partonic collider with the center of mass energy, uh, S, which is much larger than if you want uh, the interesting S at uh, scale, collision scale, because uh, the, the, the vast majority of times what you do is that you collide with a very small X and uh, one, so you can, you can imagine one tenth of the collision energy that to take out from proton collider. Let's say 14 TV LAC produces a lot of uh, one TV processes, one TV collision, but of course there is not one single event will ever be observed to have 14 or even 13 TV or, or, even, or even 10, most likely. Okay. Uh, okay, so I think I can, uh, yeah. I have to stop here uh, and see you tomorrow. Uh, so the acronym uh, is the name of famous physicist, uh, Lipatov, Gribov, uh, but I don't remember them all in order. Uh, DigiLab is, uh, is an equation. So maybe I can say a few words more about DigiLab. So DigiLab is an equation for the dependence of the PDF on Q. So you should imagine something like DF equal to some, some convolution of, with some known kernel times the PDF itself. So it's a first order differential equation that allows you to compute